In this episode, I'm joined by Camille Maureen, meditation mentor, dancer, and author of Meditation Secrets for Women, written with her husband, Dr. Lauren Roche. Camille describes her turbulent upbringing and how her discovery of practices of meditation and embodiment saw her embark on over 50 years of adventure and exploration. Camille recalls her performance career in dance and theater, how she used movement to learn to feel her emotions, and the practices she uses to process strong feelings. Camille recounts meeting Lauren Roche at a time when she had rejected romantic relationships and how she drew on her inner processes and practices to open into relationship with him. Camille also discusses meditation secrets for women, why one should not fear the depths, how to honor one's rhythms, and reflects on the limitations of male-oriented religious and spiritual systems. So without further ado, Camille Maureen. Camille Maureen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Stephen. Furu Viking. Thank you. Well, I'm so delighted to be talking with you here on the podcast. And wow, you've had a remarkable life. In fact, we were just talking before we started recording, and you, you told me 50 years of inner practice, right? <laughs> and that's amazing. It is amazing, even to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, time in case nobody's noticed, which I'm sure you have, time is very strange, mm. very strange. And it goes very quickly, you know, in retrospect and ever more poignant, therefore, mm. every, every moment more poignant. So I just put that in here right now. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And so I'd like to go back in time, actually, biographically speaking, to your upbringing. I'm really interested. What was the context of your upbringing? Can you give us a sense of that time? I can. My father was old school Italian living in a suburb and in, in the suburb of Chicago and actually the mayor of that little hamlet for decades and was when I was born. My mother was a wild free California girl, Southern California girl. And um, they might have met on an airplane because she was a, a hostess for TWA. And uh, he was coming to see the Rose Bowl in Pasadena <laughs> in California. And um, that was that. <clears throat> so, uh, however, that combination of a wild woman and an old school Italian did not go well. And the community there had nothing, no clue what to do with my mother. So their uh, conflict and their divorce when I was five influenced me a lot in which, uh, and I don't think this is unusual for a child, but it's like I witnessed them, you know, throwing their dishes back and forth and running between them, crying, that I'm not going to do it like that. that. I'm watching how they are creating hell for themselves and each other. There has to be another way. So that's kind of, that's my theme. You know, that's sort of my life theme. And... Um, Growing up, you know, shoveled around quite a lot, which I don't mind, uh, except that it was very disruptive to my schooling. Um, but it also taught me adaptability. <laughs> and um, then there came a point where uh, I had a big blow up with my mother. I'm just going to say this because it influenced everything. Uh, where I was in a private school and sitting with my black boyfriend under a tree, and he was reading me poetry, a very fine person still to this day. And my mother, for some reason, even though she's free spirit and, and had always seemed very liberal, like surprised me picking me up there. And um, we had this huge blow up and I went to live with my father and switching from private schools to public. And <clears throat> adapted, you know, and so on and so forth. And, and 
my relationship with my father was never a comfortable one. Let's just put it that way. So that all of that contributed to my naturally philosophical nature. You know, I was actually a very serious little girl. People who know me now can't believe that I do not remember having emotions. Crazy. Until much later when I started to really delve into particularly embodied practices. So <clears throat> long story short, when I was 21, I, I had been in theater. I was in Second City in uh, Chicago, same time as Bill Murray. We were kind of hanging out. <laughs> and, um, and then I decided that I, actually my teacher said, I think you need to take a movement class. So I took my first dance class and I was completely smitten. And that was that. That's my life. So the, the metaphor of everything is dance began to gestate then. And um, weirdly, at that same time, my mother was killed violently by her fourth husband. And I always thought that was a strange bequest. That somehow that I started dancing at the same, almost the same day that she died. And again, this um, commitment to myself to find what she could never, you know. So number one, a spiritual path. Two, a um, creative path. And three, love. So the intermarriage in me between those three very powerful commitments has been a, an incredible teacher. And the deeper I have gone into embodiment, because this is something that I carry uh, ways of being with energies, all the energies that a, a human heart, human body experiences. And that can be a mighty task. It can be very challenging. You know, we all feel those things. We're all on our own inner unfoldment and going for our heart's desire in one way or another. So, um, and that led to uh, eventually creating a body of work I call Moving Theater of the Soul. So I was kind of combining the dance and the theater and my inner practices. And I had been involved in many different traditions. And then also was, uh, I became involved with um, something called Continuum, Continuum with Movement, with my dear friend and mentor, Emily Conrad and community for many, for decades. And, um, and that's, that's a big influence as well. So this, um, this journey into what we mean by body, what we mean by love, what we mean to being fully alive, what we mean by being in communion with a larger field of life, what it means to what I, what I call living, to live in love's body. And in particular, along the way, as you know, um, addressing particularly women's needs in meditation. And uh, the book that I wrote with Lauren, Meditation Secrets for Women, was his idea. <laughs> yeah. Because he was seeing how I would come back from teaching my performance groups at midnight or something, completely bedraggled. And I would get up in the morning, like, and then I would go take my tea, you know, make my tea and go in the bedroom and meditate for as long as it took, you know, discovering new practices all the time. And then I would emerge and he, you know, he jokes that I looked like I had been at a Lancome spa or something like that. So that was how he got the idea to write 
that a women need to know things, you know, they need to know. So I'll pause there because that was many mouthfuls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. I'd like to touch on so many of those, those themes that you've brought up. <laughs> you, you know, one thing that strikes me is the influence of your parents' divorce. And yeah. you said that, that your life theme became, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do it that way. But that seems to beg the question, you know what you're not going to do, but how do you figure out what you are going to do? So I'm yeah. wondering about that journey. How did you discover well, how yes. to do things that weren't that? Kind of bumbling along, I suppose. Um, I don't think that's an unusual perception. As you know, I think that all of us have a version of that. Probably. Um, well, in my case, like I said, I was very philosophical, so I was drawn to studying philosophy and mythology and anthropology and psychology, you know, and the kind of interpenetration of all of those, looking for the essence in all. I, that's another keynote of what my desire is. Like, I have not felt comfortable, you know, being part of a particular tradition. I've been around many, you know, Zen and Tibetan Buddhism, big, very big in Santa Fe, where I lived for many years, and that's, and met Lauren there. That's a whole story. Um, and yoga, of course. Um, and, you know, pretty much you know, a wide variety of different approaches. Um, not identifying per se, or rather I, resonating with all of them. You know, you, pretty much you name it, you know, Native American, Celtic, you know. Um, but feeling, going deeper and deeper and deeper into what, what essence is. And then, um, like I say, I was in theater most of my life, just by accident, when I loved it. And then um, finding dance and finding all, ma all manner of subtle, subtle movement, subtle movement meditation. Um, it just all started to speak to me moment by moment. I didn't have any grand plan. I didn't know I was going to be a dancer, no clue. I did not believe in marriage at all. <laughs> so um, that was a journey with Lauren for, you know, it took me nine years before we actually got married. And, that, and then it felt natural and true for us. Um, and then meeting Lauren, you know, where we started to co-create and wow, we have, we see in very similar ways. We've had very, in, uh, on that essence level, similar journeys. Um, he and his uh, dedicated way, particularly to meditation and particularly to um, some of the uh, trainings that were available in the, set, in the late 60s and 70s. And then his discovering what he was discovering and it, and it married, you know, there was a marriage with what I had been discovering. So that's been an incredible uh, co-creation and astonishing, sometimes very challenging dance of love and of intimacy, you know. So we talk now a lot about a lot, a, a lot of about intimacy, intimacy within ourselves, and for women in particular, intimacy with our own bodies, all of us, but, and intimacy with the larger field of life, with all the nature around us, and, and intimacy with another, which is um, revolutionary, evolutionary. So I hope that addresses your question. <laughs> it, it does, certainly. It certainly does. Yeah. 
you know, I'm curious um, about that point you made. Uh, I'm curious, rather, when you said you don't remember feeling emotion, and it wasn't until you started diving more deeply into these practices of embodiment that you began to, um, I don't know, discover, awaken, or what, what, what was the case there, emotionally speaking? Can you talk about your trajectory there in terms of emotion? Emotion. Hmm. Well, I had some typical emotions as a teenager. Um, and wanting to, well, I was always kind of a loner, but you know, the way that we address what it is to be in a community of school, you know, and other classmates and catty, catty, you know, little women, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> and um, so when I started dancing, though, which was modern, you know, modern dance, contemporary dance, and so it, and, and all kinds of ethnic dances, where I would I could leap across the floor and I could discover this, this fire and this fury that had been buried. You know, these emotions wait until we have ways of actually dealing them with them. Our, you know, all of our challenges, all of our pain sometimes has to wait buried deeply in our bodies, usually, not to mention our hearts. And not to mention the psyche, and, and aren't they all interwoven? So, so that was a big clue. Um, expression, creative expression. Um, and then when I would meditate later, before I met Lauren, for example, I was in Jungian analysis that helped. <laughs> and Santa Fe has a really rich community of of uh, Jungian psychologists and depth, depth psychology uh, approaches. And that also was a container and having a wise woman mentor, which I recommend, you know, for anyone who resonates with what I'm saying. And um, so I was developing both this, how do I express the intensity so that it doesn't uh, uh, what, you know, like fester, fester inside, and then, you know, creating all kind of havoc, you know, that can lead to health stuff, it can lead to blowing up a relationship, it can, you know, and um, so I was actively discovering that, and I finally felt layers of grief, you know, I would start meditating, and this is not uncommon, where sometimes um, when you have that sacred space and you know how to make that kind of sanctuary for yourself, it's, um, and you know how to hold yourself, be held by forces larger than us, by the, by the earth, by the cosmos, things like that then these energies arise. And so for me, the grief was very profound, just sobbing, sobbing, sobbing in meditation. And feeling that I'd failed at relationships. And that led me to a period of um, marrying myself. Marrying myself and a kind of inner sovereignty and um, calling the inner beloved. So I was immersed in that and doing all kinds of uh, private, you know, rituals and retreat and solo retreats in the wilderness and sola retreats in the wilderness. And, um, you know, costuming myself and painting my face and wild, wild hair and dancing in the middle of the night and, you know, roaring and wailing and just letting it all happen. And simultaneously, that led to, like I say, calling the beloved, at, in fact, the inner, 
inner beloved. And I did not care about human relationship with a man anymore. Guess who I met? <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. I'll pause. There's more about that anytime. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, please keep going. That's that seems <laughs> an inopportune moment to meet to meet your future husband at the at the time when yeah. you, you, you don't you don't uh, need a man anymore and this sort of thing. That's very interesting. How did that happen yeah. when the two when the two of you met? Yeah. Mythic. So I must drink to this. All right. <laughs> I make these little mini rituals of, you know, the saying yes to that deeper flow, saying yes to life, saying yes to love. You know, it's a handy little thing to do mm. anytime you think of it. And you can, I, you know, I, I actually do that consciously most of the time now. It's just, can you explain what exactly what you're talking about there? So water of life, you know, the way that, it's such it's an essential element within us. We need it. We are this water, this ocean of life. In fact, that's a whole uh, particularly continuum wisdom. But also the flow of energy, the free flow, the emotional. When emotions flowing freely, the uh, kind of ecstasy that that brings, where. Um, and that's that sense of being in oneself and in the flow of life and and the way that love and love's body is that intimacy, meaning that um, recognition of this flow of life that I am and then this flow of life that you are. Um, Create creativity, meaning energies want to be creative, want to be utilized, want to enrich our experience. So for all of us, I drink to that again. <laughs> oh, so, meeting Lauren. <laughs> so as I said, I uh, so on one of my Sola retreats, this time in the Pecos wilderness near Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, in which I was asking, brace yourself, I was asking, what is it to die before I die? Which is, um, the Sufis talk about that. The, but that... You know, that theme of um, this being alive and then what is death and what is it to let go so profoundly that I feel like I'm, it can feel like dying. So that was what I was meditating with in silence by myself in the Pecos wilderness. Actually, a lovely couple, a Sufi couple, invited me to stay in their little little teensy cabin like just as big enough for a little cot and she would make me food and just leave it for me and I would walk through the rocks and the forests and the river bed dry river beds there and um, so I came back from that and to my surprise I created a performance um, called S-A-E-S-S-E, -S -S -E, meaning being a dance conceived in the wilderness. And was uh, rehearsing that performance. Um, I had three women joining, three women dancers with me, and what they were doing was playing a huge taiko drum here and there, and I would speak live and, and dance and move. So I was rehearsing that and everybody left. I walk out into the common room. This is at Project Tibet, wonderful place that uh, has was created by Tibetans, by refugee Tibetans for the Lamas. 
the Tibetan community the, the coming through, which they did a lot, um, giving empowerments, giving classes. And I, like I said, I, I resonate very deeply with them. I love them so much. I and mean, they were right there a lot of the time. So there we are at Project Tibet, which unknown to me, Lauren was in the adjacent room, a shrine room, it's like filled with Tibetan carpets and artifacts and where he was giving a meditation session to someone, no clue. I didn't, I didn't know who he was or anything. So I went in the common room, he emerged and this is gonna sound like over the top mythic, so bear with me. This is our, both of us experience this. So I didn't, we don't know each other. I don't know his name. Flash of light, both doing what we love and what we're designed for. We walk toward each other, beaming and hug. And then we found out each other's names. Had a little bit of a talk. I told him about my performance. He was going to try to come, but no, he never did. He was going back to California. So ah, marrying myself, you know, I didn't even, I barely thought about him, honestly. And, um, and then many months later, that was August of 19... 82. And um, <clears throat> that January, I get a call. It's Lauren saying the one thing <laughs> that, I, that I would respond to. Let's get together and talk about our work. Like if he'd asked me to go on a date or go to dinner, I would have said, no, I was marrying myself. I was not interested in a relationship. So anyway, from that point on, on the full moon of January, 1983, um, that was it. <laughs> With a few, you know, couple of pauses in our journey together over these all of these years before we got married and sorting out and the intense energies that were catalyzed by the intensity of the love. And um, it's amazing the evolution of depth ever, ever more precious and astonishing and fun, you know, all of those things. This is a trip, Steve. <laughs> How come? How come? Yeah. Oh, just telling you my, like, pretty much my life story. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing. Well, we've known each other for se several years <laughs> and, had, and many cool adventures and so on. But we've never sat down and had this kind of a conversation, I don't think, full life story. No, we yeah. haven't. I mean, we've had great conversations. But... Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm really loving it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. You know, it's one of the um, dances, what I, what we call syzygy, you know, this, this marriage of opposites that we're all dancing with, and there are tons of them. But one of them is uh, empowerment and vulnerability, tenderness. And as I share with you this way, it's both. There's a tenderness and a vulnerability. And, you know, I am sharing my heart, which is, I think, always a combo of those two qualities. And can we learn to embrace them both? And because we like being, you know, people tend to be on one side or the other. And so feeling that, that marriage, that inner marriage, um, so it's just a, you know, I feel like, wow, I'm talking about myself so much, you know, <laughs> yeah, that, that's the idea. Not that common. <laughs> it's not, not that common for you to do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
But, I mean, know, I, I might tell a story as a teaching point, you know, that they do that kind of thing. But yeah. Do you mind if I probe a little bit more biographically? <laughs> no, I do not mind. Okay. So this uh, intermarriage uh, uh, time, I'm curious what it was that initiated that. What was it that made you made you think, okay, presumably it's turning away from relationships with people, romantic, uh, erotic relationships with people, into this to this inner marrying yourself. But then that changed when you met Lauren. How did I'm curious about both of those changes, what initiated that change into that place? And how was it that you came out of it? You've expressed it as quite firmly, I was not interested in a relationship, it was very clear. So how, how did that change? And how did you manage that gear shift? Right? Well, it came about, um, as I say, in that period, I my a lot of my grieving at that time and when it, in meditation was feeling that I'd failed at relationships. I had been in a series of actually three year, you know, I had a three year pattern and then I would get claustrophobic and have to like, you know, feeling like I was, I wouldn't be able to be my full self. And the last one was someone I cared about very deeply, uh, native of Santa Fe actually. And um, so it was about that, but, you know, I think that was the opening for this deep, deeper well of grief that didn't necessarily have a name. You know, I don't think I've thought about my mother, for example, although I had been doing deep work with all of that with uh, my mentor, June. And... Um, and, you know, so in that ana analytic process, or rather that <clears throat> soul process, it wasn't really an analysis, the Jungian analysis, it was more like a Jungian journey, you know, soul journey, very, very profound. And going into the depths, going into darkness, going into the deep feminine, uh, getting fired up about the disparity um, well-known, you know, between uh, the world of men, the world of male traditions, um, the fear, of, that's a fantastic book she had me read, The Fear of the Feminine, um, by a psychologist, and, you know, getting really fired up about that, and, um, and actually, after I met Lauren, she said, uh, warn him, <laughs> you're reading Fear of the Feminine. Um, so that uh, feeling that I'd failed, feeling that I didn't have a clue, I'd never had a desire for children for some reason. And so I real it was that realization, oh my goodness, I need to marry myself. And I... I call the inner beloved as part of that. I didn't know what I meant, but I would walk the snowy streets of Santa Fe singing this little song, like a chant that I had that it created and, um, and going deep into that process and experiencing, experiencing that internal union, you know, feeling like I was, ah, oh, in my essence, in my self, capital S. And I also had my own, you know, extremely meaningful uh, creative path as a dancer and dancing with other, you know, uh, choreographers and my own work, you know, starting to blossom that way and teaching and teaching. So full within myself. And, you know, we'll, relationships with them and out of so much trouble, you know. <laughs> so I just gave it up. I, I just really had no interest. I was still in that. Um, and, and here's the deal. I still am. I mean, in this way, I am married to myself. And 
that yes, it's been a stretch to open to the depth of connection, AKA marriage, which, you know, as in general, I don't like that <laughs> word and this and the system of it and the expectations. Um, and in fact, um, some of you, if, if, if whoever's watching this, if you've been married, you might notice that even Lauren and I, I could feel once we actually did get married was just beautiful, timely, natural, felt like ah, a kind of bedrock. And it just felt like the next organic thing. But I noticed the collective like voices, what a husband's supposed to be, what a wife is supposed to be. And I mean, which I eschewed completely, no way, but I could feel them. And we're both rather unconventional. <laughs> and so we're both that wholeness. And we were both quite established in that in the beginning. And yet there was this um, inescapable bond between us and um, mysterious kind of connection. And so Yes, the process of opening to that has been huge for me because every time I would surrender a little bit more to love, honestly, it felt like dying. Letting go of any kind can feel like dying and letting go in a primary relationship can feel very much like that. And then being in a kind of gap of not knowing you know, where I know I'm not going to act out this thing, you know, these energies. And I could feel our parental, you know, all the legacies floating around in the space between us. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, Steve, but, you know, it's like the room is crowded when people, when, when their lovers get together, really get together. And if they're really going for it, they're there and all of their pain, all of their hopes and desires fulfilled or not, all of their expectations, all of the, you know, and what are the legacy of generations past about which I know almost nothing personally. Uh, so, but refusing, I had a very strong ethic not to act that out on Lauren. And thank God I had developed these practices. So I do my darndest best to uh, deal with those energies, not suppress or repress. No, 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 never. That doesn't work. They just, like I say, fester. They just go underground and create all kinds of, ha, gotcha. No. So, um, you know, we've been in a kind of grace for many years now where that's all just humming along and we fall down to each other each day in gratitude, really, honestly. Deeper and deeper appreciation, deeper and deeper wonder at each other, at our relationship, but in general, you know, this is a really huge keynote of what we live and what we offer is ways of um, that deeper sense of connection, of awe. I mean, to me, the fact that anything exists is mind-blowing, completely mind-blowing. The fact of this cosmos ever getting ever more, uh, the more we find out, the more mind-blowing it is. The fact that any, that of awareness, you know, what is this mysterious awareness? Um, yeah, and then as you know, developing our combined work, instinctive meditation, and um, his process of writing the new version of the Radiant Sutras. Yeah, and of course, earlier than that, our process of co-creating my little birth. This is my little baby. Um, together, our first book 
together. And uh, okay, I'll pause. Mm -hmm. well, I'd, I'd like to talk about meditation secrets for women, but I do have one more question about this area while we're here. Which practices were you drawing on when you're coming up against these energies? Yeah. Um, these patterns, your patterns, patterns of your parents, cultural patterns, etc., all feeding in. When you came up against those and you resolved, as you said, not to act them out on Lauren or suppress them or repress them. So what did you what did you do? Can you give a sense? Because I think that's a very familiar experience. Yeah. Well, I can give you a little demo. <laughs> Expressive embodied energy. So let's say uh, I'm reacting to something in a way that I that makes me feel um, dishonored, um, uh, manipulated, uh, controlled, um, something that sparks my fury. No way. And wanting to, you know, act it out in some way on, you know, in the moment. But no, it doesn't. I've learned it does not go well for me. So I would go somewhere outside is very good in front of the ocean. Very good. Where the sound of the ocean absorbs anything. <laughs> I'd go in the bedroom, for goodness sake, and <laughs> very collie like, you know, <laughs> and then suddenly it would be like, ha, <laughs> shimmering, Shakti shimmers, Shakti everywhere, Shakti energy flowing, Woof. Freely, freely, freely. Whew, I am so big. Energy is surrounding me. I am part of this magnificent expression of life. Like that. Or if something made me sad, I would sob, wail, do whatever I needed to do. Big clue, um, doing something with the mouth. Uh, I've noticed many people and many women, and this is worldwide, tend to be shy about anything other than speech. So even that can be an edge. And uh, particularly if they're being seen by someone uh, so, you know, doing it on one's own is, you know, the way to maybe begin being in a, in a supportive group is wonderful. Um, and my moving theater process has many different ways of, of addressing not only that, but also our brilliance and our, like I say, our awe and our wonder and our musings and our inspirations, our visions, our dreams. Yeah. And, and no matter what it is to feel an embodiment, and, uh, which takes time. And, and for me, it's been a gradual deepening, deepening, spreading, spreading, spreading. Um, a pause, a pause here, but like that. You know, some way to physicalize, to express creatively. Huge, hugely important. We take ourselves so literally sometimes, and if we allow the energy to express, there's something underneath it that has also been waiting, such as our love, you know, such as our deeper relaxing into pleasure, spreading, you know, spreading and grace and power and tenderness. <sighs> and 
and inspiration. Like that. Hmm. What, what do you mean by this distinction creatively? Yeah. When you go down to the level of energy, it's, it's primal, primary, and actually primordial. In other words, it's <clears throat> shed fr if we shed the presenting mask of what it looks like, in other words, the fury, if we go deeper, like, and we're, we're trying to, we don't know how to, we have all of our stories, we have all of our, you know, reactions, all of our judgments, and often toward ourselves. Um, would you ask me the question again? I asked, what do you mean by this distinction creatively? It's something you've yeah. emphasized a few times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I started getting going down and, and um, creatively. So what I mean is you don't necessarily take it literally. You have, um, when you give a creative expression to something, it's giving it another context to be held. For example, I mean, just another biographical aside, I did a um, performance. At one point, it just like flowed out of me. I was in a, a con continuum retreat, actually, and every we were in silence, and it was like a long, long, long retreat. And suddenly, I felt like a raging tiger. I'm just sitting there doing the offered practices of some kind, and everybody's very quiet, very still, and very spread out. And I'm suddenly feeling... <sighs> And what happened? I got curious. So I went out into the lobby, all, all of this in silence, and just started writing. That's a good one, journaling. That's a get be a creative act. Journaling and this whole story of this is my mother. This is like a trap. I felt like a trapped tiger. And I realized as I was writing, that's that's how my mother felt. And we're both born in the year of the tigers. So I created a piece called Tiger, Tiger, which was her story where I became her. In becoming her and knowing some things about her actual story, her, you know, her actual story, but by becoming her, embodying her creatively in that context where it's being held by this sort of mythic uh atmosphere tiger tiger and the mystery you know just and the plight of women like her but where she uh so anyway i became i became her i learned so much more than i knew cognitively i have a capacity to step into characters and take them on thoroughly and um but I, by embodying her, I just, uh, I learned so much. And so consequently, it was very freeing for me. And I felt like the legacy was also rippling, like as if my grandmother, her mother was a medical doctor. I don't know how she landed in the, in the barrio, the, you know, the, the area of um, East LA where uh, her, most of her patients were Hispanic. I don't know how she got there but a medical doctor w way before there were many, you know, one of the first. And um, so creatively means you give it like, uh, like a, a bigger story that's holding it. And just similarly, after I finished performing that, series of Tiger Tiger, my father died, whom I was not close to. And uh oh, darn it, <sighs> to do a father daughter dance. So I did and I gave it I called it losing it a dance of father, dark matter, and stars. So I gave it the context of 
the birth and death of stars and the mystery of galactic and cosmic creation. And, and that helped me to hold where I became him. I alternately went between Camille and Moreno. And again, uh, discovered so much about him and started to appreciate more about him and his struggle, his path that, I mean, I might have gotten to eventually cognitively, but what I'm saying is by having that creative context, by having um, ways of expressing where there's a, you know, it's like having a a, a sacred space. It creates create a creative context. It's like having a sacred space for um, the energies that need that want to be explored. And rather than uh, totally literal, because that's very limited. Our, it's a, a, that kind of perception where we're taking things literally. We all do. But it's 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 very um, confining, and you know it's just like all of our self descriptions, all of our uh, stories about, um, well, for example, in a relationship, you know, coming up against old stories of what it what I think it's supposed to be, or what I do not for sure want it to be, and getting curious getting more curious and feeling more deeply, you know, creative attention, creative awareness. It's where you come to meet one's own experience with that curiosity and knowing that I'm not perceiving the whole picture here. There's something else underneath, underneath. That's, that's the gem. It's the elixir, you know, of the mythic path with all of its trials and tribulations. And um, one's life is a mythic journey, a relationship is a mythic journey. So does that answer your question, mm -hmm. Steve? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if we might talk about meditation secrets for women. Yeah, <laughs> um, very good. On the back of the book, uh, it says, finally an approach to meditation, especially for women. Yeah. The benefits of meditations are manifold, but so few practices are tailored to the special needs and interests of women. So I'm curious, uh, how did you come to write this book? What are these special needs and interests? This whole this whole topic. Can you can you dive into that for us? Yeah. Thank you for asking. Well, <clears throat> uh, Lauren had written his first book, Meditation Made Easy, already. And um, it's a, it really was that time when that one time when I came out and he said, you really know secrets. Um, so he sat me, so I sat down in a, a big armchair that I use for my meditations. And he uh, just asked me, well, what do women need to know? He, Cause he got this impulse to write a book. And I just started spouting off and he, he likes to write on these five by eight cards. So he was busy and he like, he would write these down and they put them in, you know, cat, uh, rows and, and um, I don't know how long that lasted. Maybe it might've even been two hours. And then I paused and we looked at them and we saw the book. And we saw what he was actually calling my attention to the fact that there are things that women need to know, and particularly about their inner practices, can be um, can come to meet a woman's physiology, her hormones, uh, particular movements of the heart, and the social definition that we're still evolving. You know, there was a, I was of the era of when, like the second or third generation of um, uh, women's, you know, women's, what do we call it? Women's rights and all of that was happening. Um, 
So I had been influenced by that already. Uh, and this is kind of an extension of that into the inner world, which had not been talked about. And, um, you know, as I, you know, so for example, the first one is um, celebrate your senses and, sen and I add here, uh, and sensuality, and what is it like to allow oneself a feeling of pleasure in meditation? Um, and of course, now there are many people teaching tantric practices and so forth. But this uh, elemental, like, uh, connection to that larger field and to the earth and all that that means and the pleasure of, uh, you know, basking in what we love, being saturated and nourished by what we love. You might hear Lauren coming in ah, <laughs> and Lauren's phone. Um, so uh, another one is claim your inner authority, huge for still, you know, this, the book came out in early 2001 and yet it gets ever more, ever more important. Um, claim your inner authority, your own sovereignty, the feeling that you can, um, dwell in your own essence and you can take up your, your full energy space, for example. And, uh, the, you know, there are 12 secrets altogether. One and another one that's very important is do not fear the depths. Those times when we go on a sort of uh, be called down and down and in, sometimes through loss, grief, um, sometimes because of the move, the wisdom of the psyche calling it, we've been up and out and airy and, you know, being good and taking care of everybody else. And there's something else calling in the depths of soul. I, I like the word soul down in the depths and that place where we're sometimes sobbing, uh, where we're sitting at the sacred well of life. And the times of sorrow and grief and despair can be that soul call to drop down and to be held by something deeper and this great mystery, you know, that, um, and that place down there in the fertile soil where we can let go in that feeling that that's where there's that transformation where death turns back into life. That, that where the sorrow and the tears is so they water the water of the soul, watering that deep ground. And the more that we surrender to that, the more that eventually something new starts to be birthed. And it can be a very simple state of being. It can just be feeling like, living in this mystery of life, living in the mystery of death. Um, things about following your, uh, honoring your own internal rhythms, biological, emotional, hormonal, different things. Um, and on and on, you know, um, living it up. The very the twelve sex, the twelve secret is called living. Live it up. Live it up. So how do I live my creativity in the world? How do I live my passion? And how do I offer my experience up in the way that we we generally almost everyone that I've ever worked with they have a desire to be of some service, some help some contribution to that larger field of uh, humanity and, uh, and what's going on on the earth. And we all, I, I would venture to say that many of us 
feel that call now. I mean, it just gets more intense all the time. Another reason why we need really effective, loving ways of being with all that, that we're carrying in our hearts and sometimes in our bodies. Almost always it has that embodied uh, relationship. So it's something that I have taught, uh, you know, workshops, year-long workshops and trainings on meditation secrets for women. And I'm actually currently offering um, monthly new moon calls that I'm calling Evolving Meditation Secrets for Women so that I, I get to muse and, and share some of my latest uh, musings on each secret and, and a lot of interaction with the women, which I love that sense of community. So, and co-creation. Yeah. Can you, can you say something more about honoring one's rhythms as a woman? Yeah. Well, you know, for, for, for women, I mean, this is true for everyone, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, men have read the book and they relate to a lot of it, but let's say hormones, <laughs> Um, ways of kind of cooperating with the inner call that a hormone journey can like they're they're uh, wily messengers hormones sometimes giving us great joy and sometimes calling us into the depths um, sometimes burning 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 some you know depending on uh, for younger women, the monthly cycles and that interplay and feeling part of the lunar, you know, energies, lunar cycles, just, it's very helpful to feel I am part of this bigger rhythm. And then of course, perimenopause, menopause, which can be a powerful journey for, for women. Uh, in my case, I, I chose not to take hormones, it's such a personal choice. And for better or worse, it's because I am all about energy and I wanted to ride the energies and I learned so much. So I share some of that. Uh, riding the rhythms of, uh, of life. Um, of um, when, when, when we, when something uh, is, has grown and now needs to fall back and let go that we have these rhythms inside of us and we also see it everywhere around us in nature so how can i cooperate with those rhythms and not continually override from some heroic idea of power or you know where it happens so much i've work, worked with many women in corporate um, who have to like at least it's certainly Maybe it's getting better now. I don't know. Don't really hear that very much. But where a woman, in order to feel power, to be acknowledged and to feel empowered, has to take on the male, the old male way. And that sort of dominator model and that, you know, control. And, um, and we can do that. We are doing it. We can do that, but sometimes at great cost. I've worked with women who suddenly realize that their woman self, their, their deeper woman self is down in the basement, in the cellar, you know, chained up and has long gone silent from, from wailing and screaming and trying to get attention. And now, she's, you know, so what is it like to come to meet her and to let her begin to come forth and come into life and blossom into fullness. And it doesn't have to be either or, but like I say, empowerment, inner sovereignty, and our expression in the world, but also this um, deeper, more tender, more intimate, way of being with ourselves and consequently an ability to be with others in this glorious mysterious life we share yeah 
you had a lot of experience, as you mentioned, in other meditation contexts, Zen, Tibetan Buddhism, and others. So I'm curious, how exactly to put this? <laughs> Sometimes that those sorts of traditions um, can be or have been described as quite male style, male oriented. I don't know if you think that's true, and I don't know if I think that's true, but I've heard that been said. So in writing a book like Meditation Secrets for Women, presumably there's some contrast there with those other, other ways of working that you have yourself actually a lot of experience with. I wonder if you might point to that for people who are women, for example, who are in those traditions or, or working in those styles. What I don't know what what can you say into those contexts from the position from the point of view of of this this side of your work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I realized really Lauren has been aware of this, but when we started working on meditation secrets for women, we were very aware of it because many of the things that I'm that I just described about the secrets um were never on the map of what can happen in meditation. And that is because most of the traditions, I mean, really all, you know, think about it. Most of them kind of do come from male lineages and often monastic situations. And um, it just was never, never occurred to anybody to include women in the, in the equation, really. And Again, those, I'm not dissing any of the traditions. I love them. And I love the Roshis and the Lamas and the Yogi, you know, the Swamis. You know, I, I love them. Um, but I personally found at some point the limitations of it. And, you know, there are many... Therefore, uh, things that people feel meditation is supposed to be, they've heard it so many times, that they impose uh, what they think is stillness. They impose a sense of what it means to sit, sit still, shut up, you know, um, don't have thoughts, basically, or, you know, if you have them, just kind of get rid of them. And... Um, and for sure, uh, turn away from emotion. And I can understand the desire to do that. When you think about the context of some of these places, let's say India, where everything is like too much. <laughs> I can kind of understand, you know, Siddhartha, Gautama Buddha, you know, wanting to leave being king, you know, prince and king, wanting to just go off into the wilderness and, you know, walking through the through the shops and seeing people and whatever, all of the suffering, I mean, over the topness, everything over the top. And, you know, so I can understand the desire to simplify and to not be part of all of that. And what does that mean? And how does that take me? And what awareness is, what, what happens in consciousness? I mean, I understand all of that. I'm just saying that for content, so every, when I learned this from Lauren, when when uh, meditation migrates to other cultures, it is always adapted to that population. So we in the so-called West are in that process. And since Meditation Secrets came out, um, there's been a lot of progress in that for women, you know, a lot more understanding of what of woman's experience and embracing a woman's um, deeper wisdom. So uh, there's a people just still have this litany in their head that meditation means sitting still, not having thoughts. Uh, you know, don't have, don't have feelings, just, you know, don't go there, just transcend, transcend, transcend. And that gets very uh, dissociative. 
And also lots of people consequently come to us. I can't tell you, even just on the street, if we start talking to someone, they'd say, oh, I tried meditation. I can't do it. I can't stop my thoughts. You know, it's such a tragic misunderstanding because there's so much benefit on every level of our experience to have rich inner freedom and to feel that I can come to meet what all the levels of who I am. So for me, my, my practice is about the fluidity between all the dimensions. It's not like just one. It's the capacity to move as needed and to embrace the whole wild shebang, you know, what it is to be alive. And that's not easy. I mean, I can understand it's not easy because I think as uh, our own awareness continues to evolve, it's more um, multi-leveled and there much, there's more to feel and keep, and keep track of and it's always evolving. That's the thing, that's the other thing. What is an inner practice where I can feel what is evolving in me, come to meet my own gentle, expansive, natural process of evolving, of being more essentially myself, of again, living in this mystery that I am as part of the mystery of creation. I'm absolutely intimate and connected. And that life itself is always unfolding and evolving here too. So, you know, those old models, it's like they're, they're like set in stone in, in the ordinary way people talk, have, you have in the past talked about it. And so, um, you know, Lauren and I are offering this other inclusive, you know, you can be totally who you are in all the meanings of that word, those words. And um, it makes so much difference. And so people actually experience, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm at home in myself for the first time. And, and with that, there's, there can be all kinds of feelings, but one of them is usually profound joy and gratitude. Oh, here I am. And then when we come to meet another, you know, it's like, oh, here I am. Who are you? Who are you? Amazing. I would like to ask you a bit about your meditation teacher training. Oh, yeah. um, but but before before we finish, but one more topic before we get there, which is the Radiant Sutras, Lauren's version of the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra. Now you were involved. Well, I was. Uh, yes, quite heavily <laughs> in, in the formation. Can you talk a little bit about the story of, of the Radiant Sutras and particularly oh, your involvement yes. in it? Oh, yes. Lauren started working on it, I think it was 1993 or something. I didn't know what he was doing. Um, he would mention the original, uh, you know, one of the um, earliest versions of it that's in Zen Flesh, Zen Bones, Paul Reps, who had been working with Lakshmanju, I think it is, and, and so really succinct, super, super succinct uh, verses in English. And he was exposed to that in early in his, uh, when he was first starting to meditate and discovering meditation. And, um, so he started writing in 93 and I wasn't I didn't wasn't very involved but then it started to come out in in a shape you know and it's had several it had several titles earlier subtle bodies and um, and then of course meanwhile we were starting to cross pollinate in our two um our two offerings, our two uh, ways of um, offering practices to people, and very similar. Again, in our, in essence, he was more on the meditation side, even though I was 
involved, you know, I was meditating for so long. I was more on the movement and, and, and expressive side. Um, so uh, as time went on, um, and then right here in this apartment, um, I would know that when I got up, that Lauren had been writing and writing and writing. And uh, I, I started to get interested in the Sanskrit. I love languages in general. Um, so I loved it from that point of view mostly. But also as he was writing, I would, you know, when I would read it, particularly the, as it started to really evolve and take shape and uh, because of the embodied energy practices that I do, I can feel that I can feel each of the sutras pretty much. And I can feel the language and the poetry and the, you know, and, and it would help reflect those things to him. And it's, I mean, I'm, I'm always in awe. I'm more in awe of him in his capacity to find that language. Um, you know, I'm, all, I'm ever more, uh, seriously, it's a great feeling. But we have this and always had this kind of natural co-creation going on. So um, yes, I would meditate with the, with the verses. I would move with the verses. I would offer my perceptions. Maybe it changed. I would help edit, you know, a word here, sentence here, put th different things, you know. I'm a pretty good editor um, to some extent. And um, and then it, it it was that world, you know. I began to realize, oh, this is the world that we both know about, and this is a an ancient way, made contemporary and sensuous, and po you know that. Wow, we can we human beings on the planet now can receive and meet ourselves somewhere in the in these in these sutras um and then we uh some of the musicians discovered the book um usually the the yoga you know the kirtan musicians and so forth and and uh one of them dave stringer came to us and with this idea of doing sutra jams where uh, they would play as people would come to the open mic and read a sutra, and it was off the charts fun. It was like, and so I got very involved in that eventually, and we started presenting those things at um, big conferences and so forth. And it just keeps going, you know. So now um, we are. It's a one of our one of our primary textbooks for what we do offer the workshops and and even the workshops we do at Esalen and everything that aren't necessarily training Vipalu and other places and along with meditation secrets for women and Lauren's first book meditation made easy so it's just this ongoing deepening of co-creation between us and so when we would do the sutra jams you know I I would voice them, you know, I would do my voicing of the, for example, Devi, the goddess in the beginning, asking her questions, I would embody that. And then, you know, be an example of embodying and of sounding and of being with the, the gamut of emotional and, and um, subtle energies. Yeah. So it just continues. You just keep going. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's great when we have musicians with, and you helped us. You were mm -hmm. with us several yep. times. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that makes a lot of difference because then people feel more the musicality and the dance of the energies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're amazing. Yeah. Well, teacher training. I know it's a great, <laughs> a great passion of yours. Um, this uh, that you're this uh, these trainings you're offering this instinctive meditation approach. Uh, could you say a little uh, something about that approach and about this uh, format of teacher trainings? 
Yeah. Well, um, one of the reasons that we're offering, well, first of all, this latest phase, like we were offering a two-year training before this whole COVID business hit, but that, um, that, that was a 500 hour training and a you know, level one, level two. And so when the pandemic hit, there was a, uh, an inspiration. You know what? People need the skills of meditation and they need, and, they, and there are a lot of people who would actually like to know it so well that they could help reach others in their own communities and in whatever their chosen population. So we um, simplified the format a little bit and also had all this technology behind us uh, that made uh, our, our teachings, the teachings that we would offer, which was again, a combo of the Radiant Sutras, Meditation Made Easy and, and, meditation, made, uh, and meditation Secrets for Women. Did I say that? Anyway, those three books. Um, and so we journey with that community of, of trainees through, um, you know, a number of layers, essential principles that they need to know first for themselves, which can be a huge revelation and really get it for themselves. And then uh, we're also going to be beginning a, a, a level two training, 300 hour trainings that will be for those people who've completed the 200. Um, and it's just, it's a chance to interact with, you know, a larger field of people tuning themselves in the same way and exploring and discussions about what is it for you and what are your questions and what are your discoveries and what are your ahas and what are you ready to open to and claim for yourself and also that the way that we language and describe the process that makes it very natural and accessible and is different from what most people know you know some ways and then and then that feeling of um, the need on the planet, very, I feel this very, very deeply, you know, that's, and again, this feeling like, oh, this is something really effective and, and uh, helpful at a time when many people are feeling anxiety and stress and worry and trauma, you know, um, and, and also want to go deeper. They, you know, there's this one of the things about the pandemic that initially I felt very curious, like nature created this one situation where we all had to stop on our tracks and kind of feel more deeply. And, you know, the skies were clear for a while, and things like that. It was quiet. And people had to feel what really matters to me. So that's what we build on, what matters. And that's individual and it's collective. So that's what my particular keen desire is in sharing these, sharing these ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been so fascinating. The time has certainly flown <laughs> by. Thank you, Camille. Uh, is there anything else? C certainly please mention the websites. There are, there are a couple of them. Oh, yeah. Um, but also after that, is there anything that you'd like to say or anything uh, you want to add or anything still to say before we end this episode. Hmm. But first of all, the websites. Okay. First of all, the website. Well, um, meditation tt.com is a place where you can see about the trainings. Uh, the 300 hour is in, it's not out there yet, um, but will be soon. It, it's not online yet. Um, Meditation TT, get an overview. Um, we have a one of the other new things that we have now a membership site, a community site that people can join with um, that's beginning to 
it's hosting now all of our work and all of our offerings, including all, a whole bunch of free, uh, free offerings and, and other classes and workshops that we do. We have some uh, authorized teachers helping to offer some things. It's, it's pretty amazing. And the kind of place where people can talk with each other, you know, communicate with each other about their experiences and so forth. So that's, um, I might need to email you. The <laughs> I'll include all this in the, uh, the show notes, of course. So just yeah. scroll down and you'll find all this information. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's called the Radiant Sutra School of Meditation. Um, my personal site is camillemaureen.com. Uh, very humble site. <laughs> I have a little trouble keeping up with it. Uh, although I have help. Yeah, let's see. And then instinctive meditation leads to Lauren's site. So laurenroche.com, L-O-R-I-N-R-O-C-H-E. And my last name is, everyone probably knows by now, Camille is, uh, Maureen is M-A-U-R-I-N-E. So, um, well, what comes to me um, is just a kind of salutation and, and prayer together and gratitude together that um, we come together all of you, all of us, we come together on behalf of our own self, on behalf of one another, on behalf of the larger body of humanity, the world. Thank you, Stephen. Camille Maureen, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.